Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming back my good friend, Stephanie Hodge, the hilarious comedian and character actress. I just adore her and just love her so much, and uh, it's been a while since we last talked. Gonna have her on the show today, maybe comment on the quarantine situation, um talk about what's going on in our lives, stuff like that. Um, yeah, nothing much to it than that. Tomorrow's my birthday. I'm going to be 37. I'm going through a little bit of a midlife crisis, but I'm hanging in there and stuff. I mean, this quarantine is just fucking everybody up, but I will survive. I will persevere like I always do. I mean, look how many episodes of this podcast I've done, you know? <laughs> So yeah, here is my new interview with Stephanie Hodge. Hello. What's up, Steph? How are you? Uh, oh, I've lost my mind. Just like most people, I've lost my mind. What happened? Just the world. Yeah. You know, just a crazy, kooky world. And my coffee maker died. You know, on top of everything else, and you just sit around here looking at all this stuff and all these people suffering and being beaten half to death for no freaking reason except police, hello, yep. and the coffee maker died. I, I've been drinking so much coffee for the last <laughs> few months. I've pissed off a lot of people, and I've felt really bad about it when I'm interviewing certain people and I give my, my non-biased opinion about certain things. You know, and they're just politely professional, but never the same again. And I just, I feel so bad that, you know, I, that the coffee gave me bad judgment and I didn't, you know, censor myself, you know? Yeah, well, I don't know if we're too, I don't think we should have to censor ourselves. I think we should be more accepting of each other's opinion. Oh, I, I agree. But, but you know, I'm, I, I'm a dreamer. Yeah, <laughs> but you're not the only one. <laughs> that was good. Thanks. Um, yeah, just fucking. Yeah, it's just it's insane. And you know, I I did a lot of crying yesterday because just just you know, tomorrow's my birthday. I'm turning thirty-seven. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. I sing to you, but I love you, and I don't want to hurt you. <laughs> oh, if you heard my singing, oh, my God. Um, that, that, that would just... I caused, I caused cows to commit suicide out in the middle of the field. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. No, but just... I'm turning 37 tomorrow, and I'm just... I, I, for the last year and a half, I've gone through kind of a early midlife crisis because of, you know, the fact that I'm stuck here in Reading. I'm not out there. I'm fucking just doing this podcast and nothing else and just not getting the respect that I feel like I've earned, you know, just a lot of yeah. stupid shit. I know. I just want you to know that I don't know why, but you're doing it because you never let the trim his mouth. But for some reason, I put the phone out and you could hear your voice and he laid down. Uh -huh. I trimmed his name. <laughs> oh, my God. He, he probably thinks you're another... You're a cat, you're a cat whisperer on top of everything else. <gasps> Sir, I've but never... I know. <laughs> I, I know how you feel. It's ridiculous. I just, you know, I just got this part on Glow, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Wait, you, you're going to be uh, working with Marin? Mm -hmm. Yes. I fucking hope he puts you on his show because you need to be on his show. <laughs> I would love to do his show. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did one episode and then he got shut down. Yeah. And I wrestled too. And it was amazing because, you know, I'm 63. They know I'm 63. I walk in the first day for training and I'm doing my stretches and they're all kind of looking at each other like, you know, she can actually touch her toes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, she just threw herself on the floor and did that thing, and she's not crying. All right. Okay. <laughs> this makes me think, what are 63 year old people like that you can't walk into a gym and learn how to wrestle? What's wrong with people? Mm -hmm. 
That's a that's a plus though that you could touch your own toes. <laughs> that's true. Well, I didn't see them on my toes. They're fake. No, that's a lie. They're fake. <laughs> no, I didn't realize I was in as good a shape as I'm in until I got in there. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, well, maybe I should continue this. But then there was a cup of coffee and a Danish, so you know. A cup of coffee and a Danish? <laughs> I actually did start working out during this lockdown thing. Mm-hmm. Right off the old Jane Fonda tape. I started working out January 2nd, or January, was it 1st or 2nd? One of the two. And um, I lost 24 pounds. And wow. Yes. And I, I stayed away from soda and sugar and everything for two months, and then quarantine started, and now I'm back on it. But I've maintained that 24 pounds. I haven't gained any more weight. And uh, our gym opens back up again, um, I think the week yeah. after next or something. And I'm going to be back in the gym, but it's just quarantine has fucked it up where I can't go to the gym, you know. I know. It's weird because I lost weight. At first. Well, I was really, really sick, too. Mm-hmm. I had all these bizarre symptoms, and they wouldn't let me get a test. You know, I couldn't smell anything, and I couldn't taste anything. Mm-hmm. Feel like chills and freezing and vomiting and being practically delirious and having horrible chest pains and not being able to breathe very well. Mm-hmm. And being 63, they wouldn't let me test. Hmm. I just laid in bed for three weeks. Yeah. I got a, I got a COVID test. Oh my god, that was the worst feeling in the world to have that thing jammed up my nose. Ew. It was it was terrible. Yeah. It it hurts like a bitch getting that that Q tip jammed up your nose like that. It is terrible. You know, oh. I, I I rather get I rather get you know a prostate exam than get that. You know. Ew. Yeah. Well, it's weird because I, I actually called in and asked if I could get an antibody test, and then they're like, well, they don't really do anything. So I'm like, okay. <sighs> We're not handling anything well these days, our great big fat government. No. It's fucking nope. crazy, you know? And, and, you know, I don't, you know, I have my own opinion about this whole COVID thing, you know? I mean, I, I, I believed that it was real the first month. Now I'm starting to think that if this is a fucking trick that Trump is doing because he knows it's an election year, you know? No, he, this, that doesn't make, no. It doesn't pan out all the way, because, hold on. Mm-hmm. I had to change ears, because I had this discussion with a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, being sick like that, he's never been sick like that before, mm-hmm. ever in my life. I was at one one point at the Lance and Harper in here looking at me. I was like, I have to go to hospital. I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. And Harper said, if we take you there and they put you on a ventilator, you'll lose that. And I'm like, well, okay, so let's just sit here and watch me for the next few hours. And mine ended up not going because I was afraid. I was afraid to go. But this is a sickness I've never had before. And I've had everything. No, I haven't. Never had malaria. But I had pneumonia like six times in my lifetime, which is a lot. Yeah, I think you were a and little. Was, I think you you mentioned something when we had dinner last year that uh, you 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 were going through uh, some stuff. You had um, you know early diabetes and stuff. Yeah, pre diabetic. I'm pre diabetic. Well, I was. I'm not anymore. Hey, I was. Yeah, I started eating better. That's what I got. I got um, my blood sugar was 5.7 and um, it hasn't been that high since 2014 when I was drinking and so I was just uh, I fucking it scared me so I was like I'm, I'm I don't want a diabetes at all so I'm just gonna lose weight you know and I'm sure it made a yeah. huge I, it made a huge difference I went back to the doctor a month ago and we didn't have any labs done because my blood pressure was was nice and everything looked good you know, and so I'm going to keep going until my next appointment, October 22nd. I got plenty of time to do it. But for my birthday weekend, I'm going to get a cake tonight and I'm going to go nuts. <laughs> well, you should have a cake for your birthday. Yeah. My dad had diabetes and it was weird because he was so good. You know, I mean, he was so good mm-hmm. about his health and taking care of himself. But on his birthday and Thanksgiving, back away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I had That's my. Away and leave the man to his craft. <laughs> well, 
well, I, I had my appointment the week after the weekend after Thanksgiving, and I had my follow up the, a couple of days before Christmas. You know, so I went like four days uh, without eating any candy, and then I went crazy with the candy on um, on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, and then um, I didn't eat any again until um, New Year's Eve. I bought a whole bunch of candy and went crazy, and then I stopped all of it the next day. <laughs> it's just so weird. We just, I mean, I lost a lot of weight when I was sick. I mean, a lot. Well, that's the point where I was when I got it, finally got out of bed, Harper looked at me and went, go eat something. I'm like, what? No, go eat something because you're making me sick. Harper. <laughs> like, you, you look like a heroin addict. <laughs> There's there's a podcast. Yeah, I'll fix your pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, there's a pod there's a podcast. Eat pancakes for breakfast every day for two weeks. Oh my god, that's awful. Once in a while is fine, but not every day. Um, yeah. There's there's a podcast guest of mine uh, who I've become very good friends with. Um, she's she's 45. She just got diagnosed with uh, Crohn's disease, and I'm oh, so no. I'm so devastated about it. Because she's such a great person. Oh, no. That's awful. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Today is her birthday, too. Oh. Mm hmm. You going to talk to her? Wish her happy birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, I did. That sucks. I, 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 I did. I, I, I made. I, it's funny. She always likes things I post, but when I told her how I felt about her, I said, Happy birthday, my most awesome new friend. She loved it. Uh, yeah. That's nice. Yeah, I hope she doesn't well, hear it. I hope she doesn't hear this. <laughs> she <laughs> listens to a lot of my shows. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's not... Well, it's just sad, you know? I just feel like with everything going on, things like that ought not to happen. Yeah. I know that's childish. That is very childish and naive. <laughs> but still, seems to me. For the bad stuff, there ought to be a good stuff to balance stuff out, but there's mm -hmm. not. Last night, I emailed Park Overall, and I said, hey, Park, you want to come back on the podcast next week? You know, maybe uh, comment on this quarantine situation, you know, and stuff. And she replied me back this morning, what's a podcast? And I was like, exactly <laughs> what we did last year. <laughs> I, I love Park so much. Yeah. I haven't heard back from I haven't heard back from her yet, uh, but I got that this morning when I woke up to do my first podcast. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. I don't know how anybody could not love Park. Yeah. Oh, there's. Oh, I had I had a troll who um, who posted why did you why did you interview her? She's a communist, you know, because she's in politics now. <laughs> yeah, she's a communist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that is awful. That is terrible. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Everybody's crazy. Everybody's crazy. Everybody's crazy. I, everybody has. Okay. Everybody has identity politics. You know, I've had a couple of guests in the last six months basically call me a, a misogynist because I'm a fan of the show Family Guy. Oh my God. Yeah. Really? That's all it takes? Yeah. <laughs> they're fucking, they're stupid. They're twat bags. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sometimes I watch it and just sit there with my jaw hanging flat going seriously. Yeah. <laughs> But you have to admit it, it lets out the uh, the the inner twelve year old dark side of you. It does absolutely. It does. I, I, I feel terrible and guilty about it, but hey, you know, Jer <laughs> you have some place to put it, and I'm not on the streets. So Jer Jerry Lewis said that there's a <laughs> there's a nine year old in everyone. I think that everyone has a twelve year old sense of humor, and when you I think so. and when you 
and when you act like you're offended at humor of family guy to me you you you're just fucking doing that because of the fucking politics of hollywood and you're trying to fucking maintain your integrity there you know there's not a man or a woman a grown man or a woman in this world who doesn't laugh when somebody farts or talks about a sexual uh escapade they had the night before that's the 12 year old in us it is it absolutely is everybody acts like they're just so far above being a human that's what's wrong, you know, that's what's wrong with everything. Mm-hmm. He's in competition for what? What do you win? Yeah. You know, what do you win? <laughs> <laughs> How do you put that on a mantle? I don't get it, you know, just relax. You guessed right. Okay, what do I win? <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's, Jesus, it's crazy. It's just insane. It's great. you know though that I'm having this the whole protest at, um, aspect of things is amazing to me. Mm-hmm. It's just amazing, and I think it's the right time. It should have happened years ago. Oh, it did. This all happened years and years ago, over and over and over, over the years, and it's sticking this time. At least I hope it sticks. Yeah, I just you but know when you got somebody like Trump in office. Yeah, whom I I don't despise nor loathe him. You know, you can't hate a crazy person. You have to hate the crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and I hate his crazy. You know, I do hate his crazy. I have no idea what he's like, because all we see is crazy. Mm-hmm. And he's endangering every single one of us all the time. He's a narcissist. And unless you're an old white guy with money, mm-hmm. and he needs you right then and there, he doesn't give a shit about anybody or anything but himself in his own pocket. Yeah, he's like... And he's the perfect guy to have this stick with, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's the rich. He's the rich version of a fucking, you know, a mooch. Basically, you know, he needs the fucking yeah. other rich people to be around and shit, just in case you know he gets fucked up. He needs them to bail him out. You know exactly. But he goes too far, and nobody's going to bail him out. I can't believe that there are still people who back this guy, who support this guy. He yeah. shot a fucking priest with a bullet. He had him gas. And shot with a rubber bullet. A fucking priest. When was that? I never heard that story. Huh? I never heard that story. When did that happen? Oh, when he took his walk to the church for his photo op with the Bible. What year was that? They didn't know he was coming. They didn't want him to come there. Mm -hmm. And one of the, a visiting priest who was working at the, the, the church that day was outside and when he sent those military guys in front of him to clear the path of rioters, there were no rioters. There was simply a peaceful protest of, I don't know, maybe 50 people there where he was going to walk. They didn't say anything to him. They just walked up and they just gassed them and started shooting oh. rubber bullets. One of them was a fucking priest. Oh, now, the di- diocese said that they didn't want him here there. They don't condone what he did at all. And he has not visited that church since the inauguration. And that they're not with him at all. They are not at all with him. He used that strictly as a photo op, and he injured and harmed peaceful people in the process of doing so on church property, on sacred ground. I, you know, I don't even agree. You know, even I don't agree with organized religion. With organized religion, but at least I fucking know that's wrong to do. God. Yeah, I don't care what you know. That's the thing is, I'm not big on organized religion myself. Mm-hmm. But you don't go around shooting a fucking priest. You just don't. Well, it depends on the priest. Yeah. Lately, but in this <laughs> you know, I wrote a, uh, a horror story in which uh, a bunch of um, uh, Catholic schoolboys get together to kill a priest who's um, molesting kids. Ooh. Because it needs... That sounds like a great story. It needs to be told. That kind of a story needs to be told. You know, my brother, sure, he went, my brother went to Catholic school. He was molested by his priest. Dude, this is the thing that gets me. It's like all these years we live in this uh, forged society based on some societal norm that somebody thought up without leaving the building. And so you've got all these adults in positions of power, mm-hmm. priests, teachers, Boy Scout leaders, Girl Scout leaders. Yep. You know, all these people in positions of power, teachers, everybody, therapists, who are abusing children. And it just 
Just don't talk about it. Let's not talk about it. After all, that person's a therapist. After all, that's your teacher. Big freaking deal. Yeah. It's time for all of this crap to end. Children are not safe in this country for a, from the minute they're born. They're just not. Exactly. I've been telling people, you know, uh, you know, we need to spend less time worrying about what grown men and grown women do in their private time and spend a little bit more time about getting pedophiles off the streets and into their graves. Yeah, exactly. I can it with your theory. Yeah. I'm trying to talk like an adult, but it ain't happening. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm amazed at all this, and I'm just, you know, I'm just overwhelmed. And just at my age, to look through all the stuff I went through, mm-hmm. you know, and the many marches I have attended and seen, and all this stuff, you know, this is a, this is amazing that we're in the middle of this pandemic. And it is, it's, I have to, I have to tell you, I believe that it's real because I'm seeing it and I've lost people. Mm-hmm. People I know have died from this. So it's, it's kind of one of those things where I'm like, no, it's real. And if he had done, if he'd said something, if Trump had done something one week earlier, if he just said something one week earlier, I think it's like 35 or 36,000 lives would have definitely been saved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you have to start calculating how many people those 3,600 have infected. Because that's, you know, it just goes and goes. But it's just, I think, I don't know, but like I say, I'm old now and I've been in the house for far too long. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I lose weight, but then I started eating. You know, there was this thing that happened to me when my husband went to the store. Mm-hmm. He brought back cookies and ice cream and soda pop and all those things I'm not supposed to eat. So I ate all of them just to get them out of the house because that's how I take care of me, pal. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, get it out of the house. If I if you I leave, waste money. If I leave the house and I forget to bring my mask, you know, I feel really bad about it. You know. But I, yeah. I just there's just I don't know there's just something about it. I mean, if it is real, you know, I think there's 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 got to be some kind of an exaggeration of how bad it is because I think that more people die from the flu than this, you know. Oh no, I looked it up on the. It was funny because I looked it up. I don't look anything up on American websites anymore. Mm-hmm. I'll go to France or Britain. You know, Germany's got good records. Just to excellent, a good record keeping. Isn't that, how's that for a racist statement? <laughs> oh. Isn't that weird? I've always looked at that. Well, I'm, I'm most, actually found out I'm mostly German, so of course, smarter than anybody else, but Germans. But um, no, <laughs> it's just looking on every website I could find, including our own, the calculates this stuff, the different ones. Mm-mm, it kills it three times. Wow. Three times in the and people are, it's weird what it's doing to people. They think that somebody taking a specific antacid has a easier mm. go of it than people who don't. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. You know, that's the truth. I really don't think anybody knows what's going on. Well, well, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Because I just, all these weird feelings, you know, because I do, I listen to conspiracy theories all the time. You know, and a lot of them make sense, you know, um, you know, I watch Joe Rogan's podcast all the time and he's always got conspiracy theories on his show with people that he talks to, you know, um, but I, I just don't know, you know, I don't know what to believe anymore. I don't know what to, to believe with the news and just, you know, everyone giving their opinion. Everyone's got a voice now, which is a good thing, but it's just, it's hard to believe. Well, it's just, see, I, ha- I believe it because I've seen it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, four people I know died. Four fucking healthy people. Mm-hmm. There's not a thing wrong with them. Just had all the symptoms, got innovated, and died. And it's, you know, you just go, well, two of them actually were never, in, um, never had the thing. They just died. And it's one of those things where you just go, well, what is this? And my concern is, what's the truth about where it comes from? That's my concern. Yeah. So this, this is spread farther, wider, faster, and been more detrimental to us than anything we've faced before, ever, in the, in camp history. So I don't, you know, I don't know where it comes from. I'm, it's incredible to me. Oh, yay, somebody's doing somebody else on the TV. Oh, look at the police. Right? <laughs> 
Jesus. Threw himself on top of a small little teenage girl and pounded her head to the back seat. Don't remember the cops. Yeah. I just, oh, that guy's had many copies of security guard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that there are a lot of people who have been humbled by this experience. They're starting to see what their values really are, and they're getting yeah. stuff done. They're writing a lot, you know. Yeah, that's true. I've been writing. We've been writing a lot too, both Lance and I, and together. I, I want to write, but I have, I have no time because I'm just I'm interviewing a lot. But I have a script that I've been wanting. To, I've been trying to put down on paper for the last three years, but I'm just so damn busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good that you're busy, though. I mean, you are making a difference. I'm trying. You are. That is yeah. nice of you to say, but I, I'm trying. You All know. I know is that it's just, we've reached, it. I've seen enough, you know, I'm sorry, but, um, and I'm only 63, and looking at, there are people out there that are 83 that are looking at me going, you don't even know, and the truth is, I don't. <laughs> I don't even know. It's just on and on, and all of this, there should not be a, a financial divide, there should not be a racial divide, for God's sake, it's 2020, what the fuck is that? Yeah. I do not get this racist, bigoted shit at all. Yeah. I really don't. And I don't understand how so many people, how, what is the fuck is wrong with Ohio? Every time you turn, I'm finding a new place to be from. There, every time you turn around, there is some ridiculous, stupid activity or statement being done or made. It just makes everything worse. And Rand Paul, excuse me, put me in a room along with that man for five minutes. And he will see Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> I used to email him a lot, but I got blocked from his email. Who, I didn't email his mailing things like, as a, you know, come on. Who, Jesus? What do you think you're doing? You know better than this. <laughs> do you know how disappointed your grandparents are being you? Yes, you do. So stop it. <laughs> Oh my God, yeah, it's, it's insane. You know, I have a friend. She's Jewish. Her mother was a Holocaust survivor, and she's getting a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder from this whole thing. You know, because she remembers, you know, hearing stuff on the radio, and you know, um, some Nazis breaking into her house and stuff. It was scary. Oh shit! Yeah. See, this is the thing that scares me: is that so much of news is being disseminated and so many people that are out there aren't on anybody's side. Mm -hmm. They're just out there spreading chaos. That's all they want to do is spread chaos. And they don't like black people or brown people or Jewish people or Muslim people or any people that aren't white men. And there are white women who sit on their feathery little asses and say shit that they don't even understand. They're condemning themselves. When a woman tweets me and says to me, I must be awful butch to feel like women need to be equal. If I had a man and he treated me right, I would be equal. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> I'm like, what? So, because I want equality for everyone, I'm a lesbian. Okay. Okay. I don't know how the lesbians are going to feel about that, and I apologize in advance. But I'm requesting entrance <laughs> in the club because apparently I am one. I thought it was a sexual thing. I had no idea it was an equality thing, but apparently that's what it is. And I do wear a lot of uh, slacks, you know, not jeans, slacks. So she also said, I bet you wear those khaki pants. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> nobody wears khaki pants anymore, Karen. No one. So, oh yeah. God. Yeah, and you know, my friend Joe, uh, a.k.a. Rudy, who you met last uh, year when we had dinner and stuff. You know, yes, I, how is Rudy? He's doing great. You know, um, his mother, she just got um, a remission for her cancer, and everything's going great. Oh, yay! Uh, he, just, he just hates being home all the time, but he was able to get out and uh, go to Florida to uh, see his mother uh, this, at the end of this week. And um, I just, I've been telling him, you know, for 
the last few years, you know, I just I just want to go out to L.A. for at least three months and try to see if we can get anything going, you know, and stuff. And he's just, he's terrified, I think, you know. Um, yeah. He's terrified. He wants to act badly, and, he, and he's been, you know, acting in movies, you know, for a decade now, and little movies here and there and stuff, you know. And I said, I want to be a horror, a horror host. I want to have my own show for maybe streaming because I, cause it's going to be very politically incorrect what I want to do. And I want him to, to be, to be uh, one of my characters on the show and stuff. I don't even think he knows what a horror, what a, what a horror show is. I, I don't think I, next time he comes over to see me, cause he's been coming down every couple of months to visit me. Next time he comes down, which is supposed to be the end of this month, I'm going to show him um, some horror shows that I got so he can get a feel. I think he's probably thinks that I'm actually talking about, you know, a, you know, um, a show with a plot and, you know, suspense and all of that, but no, I'm not, you know, I want to yeah. you know, present the horror movie. I don't think he, he knows that, you know, and he's like, I want to go to Florida because I know a guy up there who said he can get me acting work in movies and stuff. And I was like, you know what? When guys say that they can do that for you and you're not there, it ain't going to fucking happen. And I, I want to tell him that, but I don't want to dash his hopes, you know? Yeah, it's a crap shoot anyway. Exactly. You know that. Exactly. It's a total crap shoot. And it's where you are at, at any given time that can make the difference. No one has said it's that they can... Yeah. A thousand auditions, and nobody will know your name, and then you go, you wait a year, you go to one, everything opens. Yeah. There's no sensibility to it. There's no, it's all nonsense. Well, I'm hoping I can change that when I do get my foot in the door. You know, I think that auditions should be for theater only. And I think producers and directors, they know exactly who they want for roles, but they, they like to bully people by making people jump through the hoops and beg. You know, that's the sociopathological uh, sides to them, you know. And I think that, you know, if you want to get somebody to even to, pl- to be someone who has only one line, you can just go online and look for actors. You know, they got websites, they got their demo reels and everything. You know, that's all you got to do, really. I mean, Peter Bogdanovich, one of the greatest directors of all time, he has never auditioned people for any of his movies. Never. Yeah. You know? He's he, and it is bizarre because it doesn't work. It wasn't working the same anymore anyway before all of this. And now they're trying to figure out how it's going to work. How are we going to have auditions? And I know that sag After is offering an awful, offering an awful lot of online classes on how do you make your at-home audition shine. And the weird thing is when you do them from home, yeah. you get your phone, you set it up, you find somebody to read with you, you sit down in front of your phone, you turn on the camera. Right. You read from behind it, you read from in front of it. Make sure you're well lit. And they don't want to see anything except from the shoulders up. So that's how casting has gotten. And I love a live casting session when you can go in, you yeah. know? I, I came up with this joke. I said, uh, okay, you know, back in the day when they had the casting couch, you know, for live auditions, all you had to do was walk in, take a knee, and you got the job, basically. Yep. So what do you got to do now because everything's virtual? I know what you got to do. You got to insert two fingers and say, look at me, I'm Shannon Elizabeth. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a live webcam. <laughs> I always prefer in-person auditions because in the last few I've been to have been for really deep things like the HBO thing, um, Perry Mason thing I did and Glow. These casting directors are for real, you know? They, 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 the casting directors are in the room, not the assistant, the mm-hmm. casting director. And the assistant is filming you, and it depends on who reads with you. It doesn't matter. They both read like they're supposed to, you know, like actors, instead of people saying words off a page, which is always an unfortunate reality. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I have to tell you. But they, got, they both got right in my face, right next to my face, like totally invaded my personal space. And that helped with what I was reading. So they're, they're there to help you out, you know? Mm-hmm. These at-home auditions don't really help you out. They just... 
I don't know. It's just like cutting your capacity down in half. And there are actors who say, well, if you can show it, you can show it under any circumstances. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad you have time to tell me that. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, that you have time to tell me that. <laughs> I tell you, though, I fucking just. I just I have been doing this you know podcast for three years now and I've got eight hundred and forty forty eight episodes something like that and just I've interviewed people since the year began people I never thought I would interview people I've been wanting to interview since the very beginning and I fucking I got to interview Marion Ross from Happy Days back in January oh my god I love her so much yeah do you know her. No, I never had the opportunity. I never had the privilege of meeting her. What's yeah. Like, I could just listen to her. She is just like her character on the show. She, you know, she's, you know, she's an Irish girl of integrity. She's from the Midwest. She's just like her character on the show, you know. And we just had a great half-hour conversation. Um, I had gotten in touch with her manager who had booked um, Jerry Jewell from the Facts of Life on my show the year before, and so I asked him if I could talk to Marion Ross, and he uh, booked, he set it up. And um, about two hours later, after I had finished another interview, she called me back to tell me that I was a gentleman and that she had a great time. Oh wow! You know, she's one of those people that you do things about mm -hmm. when anybody mentions her, her name, anybody. Been anywhere near her in the room goes, oh, you know, it's like yeah. when you say Betty White, everybody goes, oh, yeah, she's 92. That's hard to do. That's hard to do in this business. Yeah, she's 92, you know, and she's had quite a life, you know, and then I interviewed. Yeah. Then I, I've interviewed two people who passed away two weeks later, James Drury from the Virginian. And oh, my God. That was a good interview. I regret one thing, though. I argued with him over the fact that uh, the movie that he worked on with Sam Peckinpah was actually his second movie, but I thought it was his first, and so I kind of argued with him on it. But it turns out it was actually, I was right saying it was Randolph Scott's last movie, you know, but I wish I hadn't argued with him because it turns out he was right. It was his second movie. first one he did was a movie with Brian Keith and uh, Murray O'Hara. Um but then I interviewed Richard Hurd, and then he died two weeks later. Jesus, were you starting to feel kind of weird? It, you know what? After James Drury died, I thought to myself, I have a responsibility now. i got to interview the old people, you know, before they go. And I uh, reached out to this actor who I interviewed a couple of years ago, Grant Kramer, and his mother is Terry Moore. You know, she's an old actress from the 50s and 60s. And I said... Yeah. Uh, and I said, I know your mother just did a podcast interview recently, but do you think that uh, she would do my show next? And he says, I'll, I'll find out. And I still haven't heard back from him, you know, but that's okay. But I'm trying to get a lot more of the older people on, you know, because it could be their last one, you know. I am so grateful that you're doing that, too. Seriously, I'm really grateful that you're doing that, and that you see that aspect of yourself. Mm -hmm. You do give a tremendous amount, and there's stuff that you talk about and people you've talked to that compete. You know, oh. not, just the, not just us dumbass actors, but everybody. <laughs> We're the lesson about being in the world. Oh. They're cherished people. I mean, my God. Oh, yeah. What a wonderful thing. I'm so happy you're doing it. I'm oh. so happy that you're doing it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm finally getting musicians on. You know, I interviewed uh, today uh, Peter Zaremba from the uh, Flesh Tones. And I've, a couple of weeks ago, I had Dean Torrance from Jan and Dean. Oh, my God. I could not believe it. Oh, my God, that was a great interview. He gave me some good stuff. I feel kind of bad, though, because I told him that two of my favorite albums that him and Jan and Dean did, ironically... It was just Dean and some guy uh, pretending to be Jan because Jan had had that accident. And he, oh, he, yeah. he has very bad feelings about those albums. And I'm like, they are great. They are, 
I put those up there with Beach Boys Pet Sounds. They're, 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 they're great sunshine pop surf albums from that psychedelic period, you know. And, you know, he, sa- he sounded a little uncomfortable by it, you know. But I had to tell him I love I loved the music from that those albums. See, I didn't realize somebody else was standing in for him at all until just now. Well, let me tell you, there's there's more to it than that. Those albums did not get released for about 40 years until just recently. And I listened to them, and they are beautiful. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to check that out. Yeah, oh, God. One is called Carnival of Sound, and the other one I'm going to have to look it up. But they they are they are beautiful albums. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I've gotten so many people since the year began. It's it's insane, and I got so many coming up. You know, I got Hank Garrett, the last survivor of Car Fifty Four. Where are you? Who was a Borscht Belt comedian? Yeah, he was. Yep. But that's still on somewhere. I forget, my husband found that on TV somewhere, on some streaming network or something. Yeah. He found Cuff of Where Are You, and we, we, there were three episodes, and we watched them, and I was like, oh my God, what are these things? Here's, okay, so the other album is called Save for a Rainy Day. Okay. Yes, Save for a Rainy Day and Carnival of Sound, and they're on YouTube, and they just they're just beautiful albums. Thank you. Absolutely. You can hear my little pen scribbling away really fast. This is a loud pen. <laughs> you ever had a pen with a really loud ball on the end of it? So when you write, it goes... Shush, 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 shush. People don't use pens anymore. You're weird. <laughs> I know. I have notebooks and pens and pencils and erasers. <laughs> but look, I never pay for a pen. This one's from Carvana. Carvana? <laughs> <laughs> Carvana. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You know when you go places like banks and stuff or, you know, any dealership or something, any, anywhere that has, cheap, like, doctor's offices are great about this. They have the little buckets of pens sitting out, and they all look exactly the same, and they all have the name of the place on them. That's advertising. They wrote those off. Take a few. That's my theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, my dentist's office has lip balm out. Toothbrushes, toothpaste, and lip balm. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Really I think one it, of each, I, I think everywhere you go now is going to have hand sanitizer and fucking shields to cover yourself like you're fucking watching Gallagher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, this is the longest my fingernails have ever been in my life. Really? I don't. Hey, I'm not. I'm. You know, I'm not one of those. I'm not going to go get my nails done. Mm-hmm. And mostly I ignore them. I just keep them piled and, you know, decent. But I don't pay them or anything because that takes effort and I just don't have that kind of effort. <laughs> <laughs> I will bake you a pie, but I don't have time for my nails. And um, what was that being locked up and all? It was really fucking long and I painted them blue. Mm-hmm. It's kind of hideous. I don't yeah. know what on earth made me think about this. See, I told you. I had, okay. My, my brother had a girlfriend when he was in high school, and uh, about seven years ago, I was fucking her for a while, you know, long, this is long after, you know, he had been dating her 20 plus years, you know, and she had these long fingernails, and she was always doing elaborate colors with them, and one time we were hanging out, and she told me this dirty joke, oh God, she was a tomboy if ever there was one, but a sexy one, you know, she had these big old titties that were nice, and... She uh, she was creating a visual with her 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 long fingernails, telling me this joke. Um, why does Kermit's finger smell like bacon? And I said, Why? It says because he's finger banging Miss Piggy, and she's just she's just wiggling her finger around saying it, and I was just cracking up. I lost control. I could not help myself. And she's like, it, it wasn't that funny, and I was like. Yeah, well, you gave me a hilarious visual that punctuated it, and she yeah. she lost she lost her shit when I said that. <laughs> oh my god! She used picture things in your head. Yeah, it's a blessing and a curse. 
it is very much a blessing and a curse. <laughs> oh my God, I think about her sometimes. I, after she drove me to one of my first comedy gigs after my accident, and I never saw her again, and I've messaged her. She fucking unfriended me off Facebook, and I don't know why. But I fucking missed the fun that we had during that short time. The last two years leading up to that, you know, after we uh, reunited, you know, I didn't want to have a relationship with her or, or nothing like my brother had in high school or nothing, but I just loved hanging out with her. She was a lot of fun, you know. It's sad to lose people. I've been terrible. I mean, honestly, I've been really terrible. Of course, we know about my chronic, severe depression. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, we know about that. Yeah. And... Oddly enough, during at the start of all this lockdown and stuff, mm-hmm. my doctor was experimenting with medication. This is interesting. Found out one of the medications I've been taking for years for my depression mm-hmm. was making it worse. It was making my anxiety worse. So I get weaned off of that, and then I'm like started on a new medication, and then we get locked down. So it's been really fun for my family. <laughs> <laughs> My mother, she has anxiety, and you know, I, I the only anxiety I've ever had really is the anxiety caused by too much caffeine, like the coffee I'm drinking. But like when you have it like organically, like that, I mean, what's it like? I can imagine it, it's it's very hellish. You know, it's my whole life, and you just learn to you have to learn different ways to cope with it, and it's different for everybody. And one of the most frustrating and anxiety-inducing things is that when somebody else with anxiety comes to you and says, oh, you handle yours so well, what do you do? And when you tell them, there's a really good chance what you tell them is just going to give them anxiety. <laughs> I can't do that. That won't work for me. And it, that's just an, an, an immediate thought. You know what I mean? It's like when people hear um, something fall over in their house. Yeah. They get real quiet. They listen. They don't hear anything else. They quietly get up to see what it was. You know? Mm-hmm. Me, we're all going to be killed. You know, first thought, we're all going to die. Mm-hmm. So I don't, you know, there's, it's just this sort of like constant worst case scenario probability. You worry about it. And then once you're done with something, you're going to sit there and worry about what you said and how you said it. And if it's going to be misinterpreted and did you say that right? And it's this constant thing. And if you said all this stuff out loud, people would just wring your neck. Because mm-hmm. it's so, there's nothing you can do for somebody with anxiety. There's nothing except listen to them and think about the time in your life when you were the most anxious. Wow. And it's not necessarily fear, it's anxious. You're just anxious. I don't know how, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. That's the thing is, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> and I think now is an interesting time because so many of us just don't know. We don't know what our lives are going to be like after this. We don't even know when after this is. Yeah. You know, I've got, we've got our landlords are suing us. For fifteen hundred dollars, your landlord. Oh, the the one you were yeah, telling we me about. Before. Yeah, the one you told me about before. Yeah, yeah. right. We oh. were getting ready to move. Lance is in a car accident. Totals his car. He gets pretty racked up. I get sent home from Glow at the gym where I'm wearing my wrestling things mm-hmm. from Glow because of the coronavirus. You know, I've been working at Macy's selling fine jewelry, which is so yeah. fucking much fun. <laughs> I do love it. It's stupid how much I love it. And then when I get sent home from there, so that was the 10th, and the 13th, I get sent home from Glow. Then on the 17th, no, 13th, 14th, 15th, yeah, on the 17th, I get sent home from Macy's, and then on the 19th, we are locked down. And this is just, you know, we talked to them, we were going to move. We well, answered in the car accident. Mm-hmm. And everything was set up, but I hadn't gotten paid from grow yet, which, believe me, is enough to, we're in a new place, pay off the 1500 and get out. Mm-hmm. Well, that wasn't going to happen, and then Lance is in an accident, his car sold, he can't work, so that's not happening. Then the lockdown happens, and Harper and I get furloughed from our day job jobs. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, this, you know, Lance's job is done, it's put on hiatus. So suddenly, from having everything going our way, and being in a better position than we've been in since I went through all that stuff with my sister after my mother died. 
and she's you know she she my sister took fifty thousand dollars out of my out of our account and we're still fighting her for that mm-hmm. so there's that as soon as everything starts going well i find out i can file a lawsuit against her from keep my sister for a year and that there's other things in it that will you know i'm going to definitely win this when everything shuts down and you just don't know so that moment where that all hits you mm-hmm. What the fuck is going on with my life is a constant state of being for anxiety. Yeah. And you just have to let it go. You know, you have to learn to let it go. You have to learn to talk yourself down. And there are times when you'll be fine. You'll be like, oh, 10 years ago, this was, I would have never been able to do this. And now here I am doing it. Oh, my God, I'm fucking here doing it. I can't do this. That will happen. And it's not insecurity. And it isn't depression, and it isn't projecting things on other people that don't exist. It is just the constant, what's happening? You know, mm-hmm. what's going to happen? What's going to happen? You don't know. Nobody knows. So you have to learn and to be in question. And now is, oddly enough, been a better time for me in my anxiety. I have days where I have to, you know, take some medication and yeah. smoke some medicinal marijuana. <laughs> because I just can't see any future path right now. Yeah. And there are days where I sit and look at that and go, you know what? There's nothing written. What's my future from now on? I don't know. Guess we'll have to find out. <laughs> and I'm okay with it. You know, you have to be okay with it because what else can you do? And other days, honey, I'm just a, I'm, hmm. Mama gonna stay in bed and watch what they movies all the day. <laughs> <laughs> It's like that Poco song in Fast Times at Bridgemont High. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It even gets down to eating. In front. I used to not eat at work. I would never eat with a cast. I would never eat at work. Because you know, how do I know how that food's going to settle? Is it going to settle? Am I going to get the trot? Am I going to get gassy? Am I going to burp? Am I going to fart? Am I going to throw up? Yeah. Literally would not eat because I didn't know how that, you know, I didn't know how a hamburger was going to sit. Like I haven't had a million hamburgers in my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but this one might have something different in it, you know. And so there were plenty of times I would be on set and people would go, oh, come on, have dinner with us. I'm like, well, I think I'm just going to go around my night. And I would have like a power bar or something in there and eat some. Mm-hmm. But I avoided socializing because I couldn't. Just couldn't eat and doing stand up all this time, being so anxious. Getting out on stage, I was that's the one place I'm in control. Mm-hmm. That's my place. And I knew that even if they didn't like it, they'd laugh at it. I knew that. You don't have to like it to laugh at it, it just has to be funny. And I knew I could do that. I always knew I could do that. But I used to throw up before every single show I ever did. Yeah, got to a point where every time, you know, I was doing stand up, you know, I would stop hanging hanging out and socializing with with comedians because they were all alpha male bullies who made fun of other people, and I didn't want to do that, you know. Exactly. And, and so I developed. And when you're the only woman in that situation, that's all. Yeah, and then fucking a lot of the female comedians that uh, were. We're starting like after I, when I start when I came back from my accident and started going on stage every night for a year and stuff. Every female comedian was doing stand up for the wrong reasons, and they just they didn't know, you know, what was going to entail with it. They didn't know that guys were going to be joking around with them in in sexual ways, not necessarily be pigs, of course, but joke with them sexual ways. So they were all fucking afraid of me and shit, and they all got offended by things I said on stage, you know. And it's, and yeah. I just don't, I just don't get, you know, this this whole woke generation that's come from it. Well, the interesting thing about it is that there's, you know, whenever anything changes, we have a tendency to go, oh, it, 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 sorry, mm-hmm. sorry about that huge noise. It's okay. um, when people try to improve things. You know, I think there's a period of time when we go too far, you know. Yeah. you got to find the right, the right setting for things. Mm-hmm. And it's like, here's an example of what I think is ridiculous. When they were furloughing us from Macy's, I'm standing next to my supervisor, 
And she says corporate is suggesting that you find another uh, venue of income during the lockdown. Mm-hmm. And I said, but everybody's closing. Everybody's going to be furloughed. And whatever delivery jobs are available are either already taken or will be in an hour. And she said, well, I don't know. Corporate just said to try and do that. And I said, well, my hooking days are far behind me, but I could go to an old folks home. Did you tell me? <laughs> Oh, my God. She told me that was inappropriate and that she should report me to HR about it because it's it's uh, sexual talk and it's unwelcome oh, at work. Shut the fuck up, you old lady. <laughs> That's what I would have said to her. <laughs> she, she's, like, young enough to be my daughter. She could be my kid. Oh, she's like, a, okay, she's a millennial. Okay. Yeah, and I literally looked at her and went, are you kidding me? And she goes, yeah, and I went, you know, prostitution is legal in Nevada. And she goes, yes. Yeah. So and I went, isn't that sexual talk? Mm-hmm. And she went, well, you shouldn't talk about anything sexual at work. And I went, so everybody's at them from now on? <laughs> <laughs> Every human being that walks through this will simply be a them or a they. <laughs> Nobody gets to choose anymore. <laughs> you were trolling her. <laughs> I was. I That's went, how impressed are you, sweetie? <laughs> That's great. That's great. Because they're just, you know, it's like my, my kid. I love my kid. I would die for my kid 10 times a day, you know, you know. And I have so much respect for her. And she's so smart. And she's so wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's a, and it's a perspective that I've never, I haven't looked at, you know, before. So it's, it's, it's interesting and it's enlightening and I don't always agree with it. But it's like me saying stuff like that. I told her I said that at work. And she goes, oh, mom, you shouldn't say that at work. You know, that's not what we say at work. And I was like, no, that's what I say at work. Mm-hmm. And I think I have the right, while I'm being furloughed prior to a pandemic lockdown, mm-hmm. to make a joke that talks about prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Call me old fashioned, but hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah, I think um, anxiety. Maybe, maybe even what. Maybe that might be what Rudy's going through. You know about about the whole LA thing and stuff. You know, I'm not a big fan of the term "the big picture." You know, I think that's what he's he's trying to see. You know, but I'm also trying to see it too. And I'm thinking, you know, the big picture can be you know we're we're almost forty. You know, uh, yeah. we're, we're going to need money. We're going to need money to pay for our our funeral, our, for, pay for our family's funerals. You know, not too long from now and stuff. We got to go out there and try, or we're going to spend the rest of our lives regretting it. You know, and if we, I mean, if that's we, true. if we end up regretting it after trying, that's one thing. You know, but you never know; something good might come from it. Because I've talked to so many people, Steph, uh, that have told me amazing stories that are almost too good to be true about chances they took, you know? Um, oh, absolutely. I, That's how you, you he did, yeah, he's just, he, and I don't mean to say he just has anxiety about it, mm-hmm. but I, I say just for me. I don't say that as a definition of another person's level of anxiety or mm-hmm. to dismiss the height of, this, of uh, anxiety. I say that for me. It's just anxiety. I have to say it that way for me, or I will climb the wall. Yeah. <laughs> like, I didn't mean that as any disrespect, but yeah, you, I think you're right. I, I asked him, I said, are you afraid of doing projects with me and getting involved with me because I have no filter and you're afraid I'm, I'm, I'm going to piss a lot of people off? And he said to me, Kind of, but not really. And I'm like, well, it's either one, I'm thinking it's either one or the other, you know? You know, I'll I'll tell you this. I mean, I going back to the whole censorship thing, you know, and stuff. I made a point. I made the decision that after I get back from the hospital from my accident, I am going to be sweet as pie in my personal life and be the biggest pig in my artistic life. <laughs> you know, I love that. Yes, sweet as pie. Oh, thank you. That you I, are. and you know. Uh, it just kills me. The, the state of the world that we're in right now, mm-hmm. the head of Bohemia, which is my agency, they're my managers, agents, lawyers, the whole nine yards, balled up into one thing. They're international. They're phenomenal. They're mm-hmm. fucking amazing. And they don't take regular actors, you know? They take those of us that are a little more specialized, <laughs> which is like short bus coming. Okay. So, which is a bad joke, and I said it, 
said it, and I don't regret it. I will. As soon as we hang up, I'll think about it and go, oh, fuck, you shouldn't have said that. That was stupid. That was awful. About the... But, you know, I got... Anyway, it's one of those things where she put out and uh, um, sent us all emails that said, during this time, a lot of people are having a lot of time to sit at home and think about things and think about their future, and a lot of people are calling me and texting me and saying, oh, my cousin's nephew's girlfriend wants to come to L.A. and be an actress, which I tell her. She said, tell him, don't. She said, just tell him, don't. And I'm like, what? <laughs> she said, not now. Now is not the time. Wait until the world is in a better place. Wait until the unions know how we're going to handle things. Otherwise, they're just going to come out here and sit in a hotel or live on somebody's couch for another six months to a year. And um, I was talking to a friend of mine who's also with them, who had said, what did you think about that? And I said, I think it's true, and I think it's right, and I, I like that it's don't right now. But I said, you know, everybody told me I'd never make it. Everybody told me, oh, you'll move to L.A. and you'll be calling home, you know, in, in six months. I'll give you six months. I've been out here in months, and all of a sudden, one night, I get open space at the improv, mm-hmm. Melrose, and I walk out of there, with a manager and an agent and a publicist, mm-hmm. three paying gigs and an audition for nurses, which I got. Right. Now, if I had listened to all those people that said, oh, don't try to stand up, don't go out there, you can't do it. Yeah. You know, and I've made mistakes in my career. My personality is pretty blunt. Yeah. And I don't play games, so I haven't got as far as I probably would have. And people would love to tell me that. You know how much people love to tell me, oh, if you'd only play along, you'd be much farther. And like, and I'd probably be hanging from the rafters because I can't live with myself. Mm-hmm. I can't, and that's anxiety too. If I bullshit my way into something, I'm going to know I bullshitted my way into it. I'm going to know I didn't earn it the way you're supposed to earn it, the way I depend on me to earn things. Mm-hmm. I'm going to dislike me. I'm going to worry everybody's going to find me out, which I worry about anyway. This is a human being. People are going to find me out. I'm horrible. But, you know, his anxiety is not at all unfounded. But he can't let it run him. Everybody's afraid of being found out. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody feels this way. It's just the level of anxiety. And there's more anxiety right now than there's ever been. Mm-hmm. And more level, higher levels of anxiety. And people have gone from everyday normal human slight anxieties over realistic things to anxiety about walking out their front door. Yeah. And maybe now is the time we need those laughs and we need people who understand that and who can relate to that and relate that in their acting or their stand-up or their writing more than we ever had before. So maybe now is not the worst time. There's just not a lot going on. Mm-hmm. But you can still submit things electronically, you know. And auditions are starting. Back. If ever there was a time to seek an agent, now's the time to go on the SAG After Hotline and, you know, uh, website and do it. Get that list and do it. Everybody's at home looking at stuff. Not much going on. You could get somebody's attention right now. <laughs> I can give you a list of agents not to fucking pursue because they are fucking yeah. horrible people. Okay. I've had I've had to deal with, especially in the horror genre. Oh my god, the 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 the, the managers and agents in the horror genre they're not even managers and agents you know what they are they're fucking fans who volunteered at conventions and somehow they jump through the hoops to be uh you know bookers for them and they just fucking abuse their power like fucking crazy i call them fanagers because that's what they are right and there's this one in particular there's this one in particular he's not even a fan basically he's this he he's a gay guy who grew up uh, being bullied, his parents didn't accept him for being gay. He came out to Hollywood. He was working somewhere, and he befriended uh, this one actress who was in a very popular horror movie, and that was her only big role because she was difficult to work with. And when she started doing the conventions, she started um, bringing him uh, to conventions to be her handler. Next thing you know, he's handling about forty fucking horror stars. And he's abusing fucking his power left and right. He's, um, you know, not booking certain people after saying that he will. He's fucking um, uh, 
uh, telling uh, podcasters like myself that uh, he's going to bu- uh, book the interview, and then he doesn't, and then he fucking put the kibosh on certain people doing conventions just because their political views aren't the same as his or hers. Just fucking uh. stupid shit. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem, too, is finding the right people, and it takes a long time. And, yeah. you know, I have a great story about that. I came in and I went to a guy's office mm-hmm. that was uh, an agent mm-hmm. that was recommended to me by a friend that I literally trust with my life and still do. Mm-hmm. Still do. Hold on a sec. Okay. Wait, what did I do? <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. My plug just came unplugged and I thought, what? Ah, ah, ah. got panicky. <laughs> I know, isn't that stupid? That's I, mean, I don't have any medication right now, so that's why I'm talking a mile a minute and my tongue is slapping my own face. Well, that was a sexy panic. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. What was I saying? I forget. About going into the agent's office that you trust with your life. Oh, right. And I walk in and there's a pillow on his sofa in front of his desk that says, Dear God, send me an actor who can act. Mm-hmm. I came down, he looks at my resume, now I'm new here, so everything is, I done stand up out here, you know, I'd been on the road, and I had a resume from Minneapolis, mm-hmm. it was a good resume, it was a lot, and he looks at it, kind of flips it to the side and says, nobody cares what you did before the day you walk in and meet them, and he goes, and you don't look like anything, you don't look like anybody's mother or sister or wife, Mm-hmm. Just don't, you're too old to be a kid and too young to be a grandmother. There's just no, really, there's just no hope for you. And I went, I'm an actress. I don't have to look like this. And one would think an agent would know that an actor with a resume, albeit from Minneapolis and not great big shiny LA, would know if you're auditioning for a part, try and go and sort of just emulate that part without going in costume. I mean, don't they do that out here too? <laughs> like maybe put on a ponytail or change your clothes. And I was getting pissed. And he goes, I don't know. I just, uh, I, you know, he goes, I don't know. God, I don't know. I just don't think it's worth it. You need to go home. And on the way out, I picked up the pillow and I put it back on the couch and fluffed it. And I said, I'm going to send you another one that says, dear God, please send me an agent who can agent. <laughs> okay. That's good. He, so <clears throat> he broke my fucking heart. He actually had me read for him and he laughed in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. I'd said one line and he laughed. <laughs> it wasn't funny. <laughs> So I leave. Mm-hmm. So it's literally three weeks later, I get all this stuff. I've been out here a month. I get all this stuff coming down for me. And mm-hmm. it's a blessing. So he finds out about it. Guess who wouldn't stop calling my fucking ass every day for two and a half years? Who? Mm-hmm. Same guy. Okay. I get it. <laughs> and I, re- I, refuse, I refuse his phone calls. He called me on set. And so he was my agent and he just stopped me and I'd go over there and I'd go like, what? why are you doing this? I'm nothing. I look like nothing. I'm talentless. Nobody will want me. I need to go home. That's what you said to me. So I have nothing to say to you. You were wrong. I think it was you who said to him. Yeah. And that went on for two and a half years. And yeah. when you come across <clears throat> agents like that, <clears throat> mm-hmm. you're just like, oh. This is how you handle me. How do you handle? How do you handle casting directors? How do you handle directors and producers? You clearly don't know what the fuck you're talking about or what's going on. You have a lousy ass judgment. Mm-hmm. And this is another thing. When they say they're a boutique agency, that means they don't have very many clients. Yes. It might be because they're very selective, but it's usually because they just can't get any. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. This guy was a type B. You know, yeah. <laughs> bougie, bullshit thing. And what killed me most is I found out he was from Minnesota. So he knew everybody I worked with. Jack Rue was from Mixed Blood. He knew the guy. Mm-hmm. He knew how hard it was to get in there. God. And he just treated me like trash. And I'm like, oh my God. Then I do well, and suddenly he knew this was going to happen. He was just seeing if I'd come back and fight for myself. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. You beat your wife and then bring her flowers. God, yeah, I don't, I don't get these people. Tired last year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get these people. Yeah, I really don't. Back in February, 
I interviewed this actress um, named Bethany Wright, who was in, um, they still call me Bruce with, uh, remember Johnny Yoon? Yes. I, I, you said that name and I was like, why do I know that name? He just died a couple months ago, too. But uh, I talked to her. She played his love interest in the movie, and I've always loved her in the movie. I always thought she should have been a huge star. Um, we talked approximately two hours, approximately. Oh, wow. And 52 minutes of that interview, I counted, was about They Still Call Me Bruce. And she spent about, about 30 minutes, 25, 30 minutes, telling me about the darkness surrounding that movie for her. Um, you know, her and Johnny had a few disagreements. Uh, the producers hated her from the moment she walked into the audition. What? But he wanted her. But he thought she was she was brilliant. You know? And she was. Yeah. And um, stuff like that. She was supposed to do a nude scene, and she fought not to do it, and she won. And then she spent about twenty. Then we spent about twenty minutes talking about all the good stuff about it. Um, you know, there was pranks on the set, stuff like that. She's very proud of the movie and stuff. Um, she just has fond memories of it. And she's very proud of it. But she said there was some dark stuff on there, and she slowly told me, you know, about all of it. You know. Oh my god. And then she, we talked about, you know, other things that she did. And all the freaking chauvinism that she had to endure in the business, and amazing stuff that she persevered from. Uh, you know, she had to take care of her mother till she died. You know, one of her husbands died in a motorcycle accident. Um, Jesus. Just a lot of stuff that she had to endure, right? And the whole time she's living in Las Vegas or Texas, she's becoming, you know, bi coastal that way. She had a, she had the opportunity to move to Hollywood, and so many people wanted her to, and she she did want to, but just life was always getting in the way, and she enjoyed making a living, you know, doing the roles that she did, you know, in Texas for the most part. She was doing stuff in Texas, you know, and that movie. Yeah, but that's good to know that she was doing stuff because it would be sinful, and I don't believe in sin, but it would be sinful for her not to do stuff. Yeah. She did movies in Texas. You know, that movie was shot in Houston. She was just doing all the stuff in Texas. She was on um, um, Walker, Texas Ranger a couple times with Chuck Norris. I mean, lots of stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, in the last decade or so, she's really um, started to uh, slowly come back and stuff after she... She, she was always working as a Marilyn, Ro Marilyn Monroe impersonator, but it be, but after the uh, the acting dried up, it became her primary source of income. You know mm -hmm. that she really walked away from acting and focused on that and other stuff. And she just got married again uh, just recently. And I, she said, "This one's going to stick this time, <laughs> <laughs> unless unless she loses him. You know, like she lost her second husband. You know, I hope not. but I hope not. Yeah, I don't either." But that was one of two interviews I've done this year that have really stayed with me for 24 hours. I was just so touched, not only by her story, but the fact that she uh, opened up to me like that. I don't think she's ever done an interview in her life, and I think that she just really, you know, prepared herself to go all out, you know? No, but it's really easy to talk to you. Oh. It's so easy to talk to you. I tell you things. I like for your podcast. I don't tell anybody else. I haven't spoken up, and it's weird because you get it. You actually get it, and you know that these moments where you just, you know, I'm standing in that agent's office, being fresh off the from Minneapolis boat, mm. and being scared and anxious and, and horrified, all, you know, and just spent six hours getting ready and just to hear that you're worthless. Was just fucking devastating, but I stood up for myself. But now, you know, then I spent months looking back on that. Going, oh, you probably just ruined your entire career for saying that to that guy. You're never gonna have a career. You're never gonna have a career. <laughs> you know. But the weird thing is, how many people told me, "Nah, you're not gonna do anything." How many people? More than told me, "Oh, you'll be fine." <laughs> oh, people tell me all the time I can't do something, or I'm 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 way in over my head and shit all the time. 
I think the thing that is important to remember is that I'm not doing this for the wrong reasons. You're not doing it for the wrong reasons. He doesn't want to do what he want, doesn't want to do the acting for the wrong reasons. It's not to be rich and famous and have limousines and people stalk you when you try to go to the bathroom at Macy's. That's not what it's for. Mm -hmm. It's for representation. It's for storytelling. It's for humor. It's to just be part of a, of a story that reaches out and affects people. Mm -hmm. That's all. Just want to be an actor. You know? Yeah. So, the second... Oh, go ahead. I think that's... It's weird because I, some people think I'm a failure, and I'm like, do you realize what I'm doing right now? Do you realize what I just said? Do you realize what You're not a who you just directed me and who I'm standing in fucking rooms with? Yeah. So I am elated. But, you know, if people don't get it, they don't get it. Like, why aren't you on TV every week? I don't know. Why don't you get a recommendation and a bonus check from your boss every week? <laughs> yeah. I was... This is one of the things I was I was listening I was hearing on Joe Rogan the other day. It's like, you know, people are always telling people, get your shit together. No, how about you help me get my shit together? Everybody needs to fucking help everybody and the world will be a better place. You know? That's true. Yeah. It's just that was true. Nine eleven made so many people fucking just become greedy and corporate and I don't know how that that perspired. I, I don't know. I mean, it was always there. The greed was always there. But then I just think that after 9-11, it just amplified. I think you're right. And I think with what's going on right now, I mean, thank God, finally, you know, we might actually have racial equality before I get. Mm -hmm. That would be good. I would really love that. Just equality. Because I honestly think if we have equality, if everybody looked at everybody else as equal, mm -hmm. And the rest of the inconsequential bullshit, like how much money you have or what kind of car you drive, was a non sequitur. It was just completely un not in that equation. You just look at other people as an equal person and say, what can we do? Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? Let's figure some stuff out. What a lovely world we'd live in. There would still be disagreements. People would have different opinions. They would live different lifestyles, but there wouldn't be this ridiculous blocking a phenomenal talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, and that's that's a problem for me. It's like there's so many fucking talented people in the world, smart people, people with ideas and experiences that need to be shared. Yeah. And not, it's not happening. The other, the other interview I did that stayed with me for 24 hours last month, um, I, I did a whole month-long uh, block on here where I, I, there's quite a few episodes I didn't share on Facebook because I didn't want to offend people. I uh, did a month-long block where I was having porn stars and sex experts on talking about sex and masturbation because uh, May was International Masturbation Month. And oh, one of my good friends is a porn guy, porn actor. Really? Yes. I'll DM you his messages. Uh, I'll ask if I can talk. Well, I'll ask him if I can send it to you, then I'll send it to you. And he's a great guy. He's really funny. Mm -hmm. And he, I met him. He did a small part on Unhappily Ever After as a muscle guy on the beach. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I, I interviewed this um, sex doctor. She's been in a wheelchair since she was six years old because she has autoimmune disease. And... Um, she went to college for 10 years, including in my hometown, San Mateo. She went to Stanford. And uh, during her last year, uh, she was taking all these different random things. She didn't know what she wanted to be. But after she saw a lecture about how disabled people feel like they're injustice because of, um, um, well, a number of reasons. But they think that they're not represented sexually. And that, you know, people never talk about um, their sex lives. You know, people never talk about the disabled sex lives and they are afraid to ask for help regarding their sex lives. So she saw the light and decided to become a sex therapist for disabled people. And she's got a practice in L.A. And I wanted to have her on after listening to her on this podcast. And, oh, my God, she was so nonjudgmental. 
a great storyteller, so articulate, a lot of fun, and I made her laugh. And I was I was my dirty, non-filter self, and it made her laugh. She wasn't. <laughs> She, she gave me a warning in an email, though. She's like, I'm not going to talk about my personal sex life, though, but you can tell me about yours, and you can be as dirty as you want. I, I don't judge that. And I said, absolutely. And I told her about, you know, I had sex with a girl in a wheelchair one time um, when I was 26 and working at a bar. Um, you know, I she was, you know, I, I stood up, and she was in the wheelchair, you know, giving me a blow job and I was holding on to her bars, you know, and stuff. I told her that and she, she laughed and she was like, wow, that's good. I mean, that's, you know, I, I mean, that shows that she was comfortable with you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Did you put the brakes on though? Yes. <laughs> I know that sounds silly and it's funny, but that's honestly a question that I've had. When you think about it, you yeah. know. She, she was a tiny little Remember thing. Yeah, and she was a tiny little thing, so I was able to, like, pick her up and, like, put her in the bed with me and stuff, you know, and I was just very gentle with her, you know? Oh, See, that's what, I don't understand this stuff. We have this opportunity right now to really, truly awaken a lot of things in people. We are never going to be truly woke because we are human beings. And only exactly. you the tiny portion of our brain. But there's so much opportunity here because I'm tired of this whole, this is, you know, most definitely don't be inappropriate. I'm not inappropriate. Yeah. We're talking about real stuff that real people do all the freaking time, and it's not inappropriate. What's inappropriate? Yep. I'm not going to talk about certain things in certain places. I know what's right and what's wrong as far as society and stuff, but this is good. But, you know, we don't want to talk about it. We weren't allowed to talk about, um, one set I worked on, we weren't allowed to talk about religion or politics. Right. And I said, we're in LA. Are there any Republicans here? Not anymore. <laughs> we're, not, we're not allowed to talk about that. And I said, no, I'm serious. We're not allowed to talk about religion or politics. And we're all like industry people. So the chances of there being a really right-wing Tea Party conservative Republican in this room are nil. Especially with what I was working on at the time. Yeah. And it was like, because it was, it was somebody else's show and it was a really nasty little episode. It was really fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a funnier guy. But I was like, are you kidding me? This is insane. What? What are we going to talk about then? You know, recipes. Don't make us out like a bunch of old ladies knitting. We gotta talk. There's stuff going on. Let us talk. Please let us talk. And he's a young guy and he was intimidated by me, so he goes, Oh, just don't talk loud. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, You're not allowed to talk about certain things and certain things. I understand nobody wants to talk about a yeast infection while you're having onion soup. I get that. The onion soup. <laughs> <laughs> That's but good. That doesn't mean people don't get yeast infections, you know? And there's nothing wrong with talking about it. Just choose when. That's all. Well, if you do have a yeast infection, bake me a fucking loaf of bread. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a birthday cake, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. You can buy a breast milk out here. Frozen breast milk. Breast milk. <laughs> I know. It's like you just go, oh, here's my cat. He's insane. Oh, we have a cat now. We have a cat. We her name is Cinnamon. We call her Hoe Bag because she's always laying on her back, posing all sexy. <laughs> yeah, she has personality. She is smart. She can open my door and look through my blinds. I mean, she is strong. Ooh, isn't it fun to have a cat like that? It's it is. I mean, yeah. she can be challenging, but I love her. We have a cat who's. Uh... Um, I said his name and his ears just moved all around like a big circle. But he knows he's special. He's huge. He can open the doors and... Oh, God, I just... All kinds of things. I just saw... And fa- he's calling me. <laughs> on Facebook, I just saw Ben and Jerry launches a new anti-Trump ice cream flavor called Pecan Resist. <laughs> Oh, that would be brilliant. Oh, my God. So my 
kids going to a protest now. Oh, yeah? That's going to be scary. Yeah, yeah but she, she knows how to handle herself, and she's been disseminating the rules online, as have I, mm-hmm. going to protest. Like, wear a damp mask and take another mask with you, because if you have it with two guys, a damp mask is going to help yeah. a lot. <laughs> wear goggles. Wear a bike helmet. Take one with you, at least. Mm-hmm. Seriously. Write down your name, your phone number, your address, your lawyer's name and phone number and address, and a contact or two in Tamiya Inc. on your side. It doesn't matter if it's for weeks. It might just save you. Take your ID, put it inside your clothes, secured so you can't be taken from you. Mm-hmm. And put it in the back of your underwear. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> We're layers and layers of clothes. Because if a cop's going after you and you're wearing a red hoodie, you ditch that. You got a black one underneath. What's that? You? Yeah. I this is my kid. This is what she's been doing. She's been helping people get through being arrested and what to do and how to protect yourself. And go, go, go. And she's going to my community college. I'm surprised there hasn't been another comedy strike, you know, with the way open micers are fucking treated. You know what? That really pisses me off. It really does. Mm-hmm. What is going on? Explain this to me. Yeah. It's fucked up. I don't get it. Yeah. I was thinking about, you know, initiating it when I, when I moved out there at some point. Because <laughs> I knew I was going to experience it, you know, because I did in the Bay Area. But I just think it's fucking insane. Over there, you know, it's yeah, it's it's wrong. It is. I haven't been stand up in a really long time because I, I, you know, not to be arrogant, but I don't want to pay somebody fifty dollars to drive two and a half hours with four people who are going to pay full price tickets and each buy two drinks so I can get three minutes. Yeah, I can't afford it. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, fucking. When Andrew Dice Clay went from New York to L.A. to audition at the Comedy Store, he had three minutes, but he did 30, and he got screamed at by the guy who was running the open mic, you know. And he said, you know, I just came all the way here from Brooklyn. Three minutes wasn't going to cut it, you know, even if it's an audition, you know. (laughs) But then it was okay because Mitzi passed him, you know. (laughs) I, I, I'd love to do some stand up again, but I just got, I have no desire to. It's, it's just, there's. just full of enough hip right now. Do you know what I think yeah, you should yeah. do? Do you know what I think you should seriously do, Steph, and I think you could pull it off, is do a one woman show? I would love to. I've actually been working on one. That's yeah. I've been doing. I think you should. And it's interesting because, you know, Lance said, we know enough people. Somebody give you this space. We can film it. Come on. We, have, we know people. Yeah. Yeah, I think you should. After quarantine's over, I think that that you should, you know, make that a priority because you have a great story to tell. You've been through a lot and you've seen a lot, you know, and just like me, you've pissed off a lot of people opening your mouth, you know. (laughs) Yeah. Hold on just one second. <laughs> yeah. I'm holding this world together in my little bedroom. Oh. No, it's, you know, we're just doing a thing. Our landlords are suing us for $1,500 for March. <sighs> That's just insane. And we told them we'll pay that back as soon as we. I haven't gotten my unemployment yet. Dude. Yeah. I haven't gotten my unemployment yet. My last day of work was. The seventeenth of March. Uh, are you good? Say- stimulus check and my uh, residual checks are all late because who's working at SAG after? Nobody. <laughs> exactly. Are you- I look at this like there's going to be a windfall once this is all over. <laughs> are, <laughs> are you good at saving money? I am. Yes, I am. I'm finally 
good at saving money. For a long time, I wasn't. When I, especially when I was drinking, I wasn't. Um, I've, I've become really good at it. You know, I got so much money saved for in case the shit hits the fan. And I think that America is going to start doing that more because it could happen any time. I think so, too. I think, you know, the whole trouble that we had was that when my mother died, she left my daughter. I told you this, just enough mm -hmm. to cancel all of her scholarships and all of her financial aid, which was paying for her $50,000 a year schooling. That was freshman year that happened. So we paid for it. Mm -hmm. We paid for it. We paid for her college for three and a half years, 50 grand. God. Yes. semester. So, yeah, whatever we had is gone. Our kid is highly educated, and it's proven to be the best investment we ever made, and that's great. But, uh, you know, and we had stuff set aside, but if my sister hadn't stolen it, we'd be okay. We could help somebody else. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But everybody's, there's just nothing. And it's just people are not being kind or loving about it at all. Or, well, some people are, you know, but it's like you have to call your credit cards every month. You go, I still can't pay you, and they're like, okay, no problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's just like nothing bad happens. It does go in your credit report, which is really stupid because you just have to call them and say, take that off my credit report. It's the lockdown thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's all these phone calls that you have to make, these constant phone calls. Can't pay the card. Okay, it's all right. Take it off my credit report. Okay, it's all right. Mm -hmm. You know, over and over and over and over. And some people are being great about it, and some people, like our landlords, are not. Yeah. You know, I'm we... are squatters. We're squatters. Squatters, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're squatters. Yeah. And then here's the fun part. Mm -hmm. We have told them all along, the minute we get any money at all that we're owed, mm -hmm. you will send it to you. They said, we don't want your money, we want the keys and for you to move out. And they sued us. Mm -hmm. And they said, we don't want your money in an email. You know what that means? What does that mean? We're going to court. Ugh. And we're countersuing them for emotional duress. And psychological distress. I'm so sorry you have to go through that. I really am. I'm not, because they'll settle. They yeah. don't want to go to court. If they go to court, then they have to have an inspector come and inspect their house. And there are two holes in two different walls of their house. Because they had to fix the plumbing. And they never fixed the holes. They saw it into the walls. God. And we even have emails and texts with them saying, you got to plug up these holes. Plug yeah. up the holes. Why don't you come fix these holes? Well, it's we're busy. You do it. It's like, oh. No, then you look it up because if you do repairs on the house and you don't do them according to code, then you have to pay the fine. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, no, here's the law. Why are you bringing the law into this? Because <laughs> 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 it's helpful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, my mom. That's yeah, my mom. She's in the middle of suing the company that uh, she, you know, she worked for because of you know they didn't pick up that office equipment and she had to have surgery on her shoulder. She just had her second surgery on Tuesday, and next she's got her hip next. You know, um, I don't know how that's going to play out the whole lawsuit though, but I hope we get a fucking million dollars out of it. <laughs> I do too, man. I'm gonna put every good energy and good thought that I got to that. Thank you, thank That's you. That's crazy. That's just crazy when you have to go through all that. Yeah. But see, this is the thing, you know, it's like I talk to them over here and we have great volunteer lawyers working on this stuff. And it puts things into perspective when she says to me, Tell them you want to go to court because what they sent you they call complete. They have sworn an affidavit that everything they sent you is a complete record of what's happened. And yet you are showing me emails and texts and letters that mm -hmm. they left out that negates every single thing they said in their lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. She said, tell them you want to go to court. So I told them, let's go to court. And she said, let me give you a timeline on when this is going to happen. First of all, when they say you have 10 days to respond, you have 70 because it was March 
27th, the governor said you can't be evicted. And no eviction notices, no lawsuits about rent or any of that crap can happen until after the other court docu- documents have been filed and attended to that involve violence, damage, murder, death, assault, um, like everything. Mm-hmm. Everything before us. Everything. Except parking tickets, they come last. <laughs> and she said, right now on the docket, we have probably eight to 10,000 mm-hmm. burglaries with assault. So you have 60 days to respond to them, not 10. You actually have 70 to respond mm-hmm. to them. And when you respond and file your response, it'll go into the court system. In about two years, you'll get a phone call saying, we're not going to accept this case because they filed a false report. Mm-hmm. And she said, so for two years, you can sit and be wherever you want to be and do whatever you want to do, knowing full well nothing's going to come of this, and they can sweat because they know they've lied. Mm-hmm. And they're just harassing you. And they do. They send us texts like once a week. Why aren't you out? Yeah. Well, because we're out in lockdown. Seriously? A week after the lockdown. We need you to move. I said, well, we're in a lockdown right now. It's illegal. Yeah. And... You know, we'll get you that 1500 as soon as we can. <laughs> okay, fine, but you really need to be out. And I'm like, <laughs> they have a lockdown. So I called the sheriff's department, and I told him, what was this lady says, I only have to move because we have $1,500. And um, we're in lockdown. He said, okay, we'll tell you to quit harassing you you file a lawsuit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And that's the fun thing trying to explain to my daughter how sometimes the police can be your friend. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Just <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're like inside and really white, the police can be your friend. <laughs> that's great. I I uh, uh, the week of the, the week before lockdown, a friend of mine she called me and was crying to me because um she had um, one of her ovaries removed. Um, she had like a she had like a blood clot or something down there, and she was just really feeling really emotional and sad about it, you know. And I made her laugh. I said, uh, you, "You know those um, those 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 rainbow lollipops you get at the carnival? You know they're kind of like swirled on the stick." Yeah. I said, "I bet that's what that's what her fallopian tubes look like." <laughs> she lost it. She was cracking up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. That would be hilarious if that's what they look like. Yeah. Over <laughs> <laughs> was like either like cotton candy balls. That would be <laughs> cotton candy balls. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. That's a hard thing to say to you. Does that speed up your your hormones and it assault the whole thing about being a woman, you know, it's hard. That's awful. I'm so sorry she had to go through that. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty, it was pretty bad, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, she's a little older now, but, um, yeah, stuff like mm-hmm. that happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love those. <laughs> and by the way, I eat that candy a lot. I'm going to be eating it with the same thoughts as before. I feel, you know, I feel really good though that I made her laugh, you know? Yeah. Funny, now I'm never gonna get that image out of my head. <laughs> you know, I forgot <laughs> I forgot that you I forgot that you were in evolution. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my that god. Was, that was that was fun to do. That was fun to do. How how was your experience working with Ivan Reitman? You know, he's a disciplinarian. Yes. He knows what he wants. He tells you what he wants, and you give him what he wants. And if you do, his, his light will shine upon you. And if you do not, his light does not shine upon you. I, he will take you aside and say, what is it? What's bothering you? What can I do to make you get what I'm not getting you to get? Yeah. And he was amazing to me because, you know, I go, I do, I do what I'm told. I'm not going to argue unless it's something huge. Mm-hmm. It, you know what I say? 
and I'm just not going to argue. If it was something, if I'm talking to a man and I keep calling her Tina, him Tina, mm-hmm. and he's not trans, then I'm going to raise a question. But I'm just doing the. I mean, he, look who he is. Who, what am I going to question? So I'm sitting there and I'm doing the stuff, and there's another actress that was involved, and she said she had taken a lot of Sudafed mm-hmm. that day. She couldn't remember her lines. She couldn't say them, and she could remember them, and she was shaking from head to toe the entire time. And this is not an actress who is new to the experience. And he came to out. He he came to me, Mr. Rick, and came to me, and he said, "What do you think is wrong with her?" And I said, "Well, she said she took too much allergy medication." But I said, "I think she's freaking herself out, and I think that whatever she took was more than that." And it didn't give her the bump she thought it was going to give her. So instead of energy and focus, she's all over the place. So I'm thinking warm milk and honey would be a good thing. <laughs> and he asked me, and then he asked one of the other actresses, and she's so cute. She's got the curly hair, and she's the little chubby one that was in there. And she's so smart and so cute. She's a fucking Mensa member. She mm-hmm. like, you just need to like tell her she's fabulous and she'll feel okay. Because I think she's high. <laughs> <laughs> so many other directors I worked with would have blown a gasket. You know? Yeah. First of all, would have never asked the other actors if they were feeling something or had a sense that something was wrong. And we all said, you know, she just needs, she needs reassurance. She's losing her shit because she, she, she's scared. Mm-hmm. We have to get her down from being scared. Fuck everything else. Get the scared away and she'll be fine. Yeah. And he's no idiot. He knew. He just wanted us to know that he knew. That's what he was doing. He was letting us know he knew, and he was going to take hand on it. Mm-hmm. He wasn't asking our advice. He was letting us feel like we were giving him advice in a situation he already had planned to control. Yeah. That's a good director. That is. I... A good man. And he told me that he really liked me and that... Um, if there was anything I could do on set that I wasn't doing off camera, what would it be? And I said, I'd love to sit with you. And he goes, great, got your chair right here. And he let me sit next to him for an entire fucking day and night and watch him. Wow. Yeah. Um, a lot. Yeah. A couple months ago, I interviewed an actor who did four movies with him um, in the late eighties, early nineties. And I said to him, how is it working with, uh, Ivan Reitman, and he said, not particularly fun, very challenging. And I said, then why do you work with him? And he says, I'm an actor, I need to pay the bills, and if he likes me, then I go, but I don't like him. See, that's weird. I love him, because he yeah. was challenging. He didn't take any shit from anybody. He knew exactly what he was doing when he was manipulating his actors. And directing means manipulate your actors. Yeah. And it doesn't mean just to tell them where to move or how to look. You have to control 100% of an actor's humanity when you're a director. Because there's way too many different kinds of actors and mm-hmm. different kinds of people in acting, and not one of us is confident. Otherwise, we wouldn't be looking for approval. Yeah. That's just the truth. And so, you know, I like that. I love that discipline. I love that fucking get in there and do it. I'm giving you one. He would look at me and go, I'll give you one shot. And we're going to print whatever comes up. Mm-hmm. It better be good. I'm like, all right, drop that gauntlet. That doesn't bother me. And there were times he retook me picking up a gun 37 times mm-hmm. <laughs> until he got what he wanted. I don't resent that. And it didn't. Honestly, he did it in such a way that it didn't make me feel like it was my fault, even though it was my fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I really liked him. But I like strict directors anyway. <laughs> Another actor I like who's in that movie is uh, Ethan Suppley. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. He, he was so great when he was in the Kevin Smith movie Mall Rats. He's always staring at this, at this multidimensional picture, and he can't see the sailboat that's supposed to be there. <laughs> and this kid comes over there and he's like, hey, look, it's a schooner. And he's like, ha, 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 you little bastard, it's a sailboat. And he's like, a sailboat is a schooner, you moron. And then he's like, you know what? There is no Easter Bunny. Over there, it's a guy in a suit. (laughs) (laughs) So great.
great. <laughs> When he was on The Simpsons, him and Julian Anderson did an X-Files parody on The Simpsons. Everyone just had so much trouble not laughing at David Duchovny. I mean, my God, one time he just he just asked me the question and he said, he looked at me and when the shot moved over to me, he took with his head to the side and I almost fell down. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, what are you doing and why is it making me laugh? You just control yourself, actors. Control yourself. <laughs> they're like yeah they got like homer simpson on an exercise bike and they're like he's like what, what's the point of this test and he's like i don't know i just thought it'd be good for him to lose weight and then <laughs> and then the company's like his fat is making me very sleepy <laughs> it's very <laughs> hypnotic <laughs> What's the stat? He did ask me if I took baths with my baby. <laughs> really? He goes, yeah, Mom. I went, yeah. He goes, you took baths with your baby? I said, yeah. He goes, I take baths with my baby, too. I'm like, yeah, that's fine, huh? He goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he walked away. And it's one of those people I'm talking about. When people create those moments that just sort of leave you spinning and you have to laugh. So she said, that, that was on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good that he's a good guy. Last time uh, we were talking, you mentioned that uh, you had done that um, HBO pilot for the reboot of Perry Mason. Do you know when that's going to premiere? You know what? I don't, and I've been trying to find out, and I just I haven't been able to find out yet. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's like um, my, um, one of my people from Bohemia just said, you know, there's so much going on right now. Mm -hmm. that um, things that were supposed to air aren't going to air until later. They haven't decided on dates yet because nobody knows what's going on. And when is a good time, you know, to present something new and important when the whole world's on fire and people are in the streets. So it's kind of one of those things where they're right now they're just trying to figure out what steps to take next. So all there's a ton of stuff that's been shot that hasn't been released. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff, different uh, production companies and houses. We shot a lot of stuff, and we haven't, you know. So I don't know. And they have to. They want to do press about it, and they can't do press about it. So it's just delaying everything. But I'll let you know as soon as I do. I look every single day. I like look like some six-year-old kid waiting for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, because I would love to see it. You know. I can't wait to see it. I don't want to see me, but I don't want to see everybody else. I hate watching me. I'm never good enough. You know, I'm not. I'm never good enough. I look fat. I look old. I'm hideous. My hair's dumb. Everything I say, it's like, it's like the Beatles. You know, That's why I love uh, talking to comedians because they'll, they'll, they'll tell me if something's not funny, you know, um, you know, uh, I, I love Lois Bromfield and whenever I talk to her, you know, I, I make her laugh all the time, you know, but she would tell me if something wasn't funny. Well, that's good. I mean, we have to tell each other that. We owe it to each other. Mm -hmm. We really do. We're all suffering the same suffering. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You should do each other. See, I just, you know, the whole women in comedy thing is just still. It's still. Uh, yeah. Why can't we just do comedy as people? Why does everything have to be militant and aggressive? And, and this, you know, why would, 
Who I inspire this trust in anybody? There's men and women. We do stand up. Let's do stand up. Yeah. Forget about the rest of it. I just don't get it, you know. This fucking identity politics is just, it pisses me off, you know. Yeah. Just stupid. It's amazing, and I'm kind of tired of people going, oh, I'm, a, I'm on the edge. I'm like, not if you say you are. <laughs> <laughs> and not if you say you are, and then you go out there and you say, heck and darn. Maybe that's edgy where you're from. Mm-hmm. But maybe a joke or two would be good in there, too. So I was just talking about how cool you are. I watched some comic on YouTube. I don't know the kid's name. Mm-hmm. But I got a private message from somebody asking me to watch it because it was their friend's friend's something or other. You know how that goes. Yeah. And I watched it and I was like, oh my God, this is a panicky child who's, who's like more grown, not as grown up as they are as old. And they're not relating anything relatable. <laughs> you just really, it sounds, it just literally sounded like they were really enamored with themselves and were giving a resume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's one of those things where you go, you know, if you say that enough times to yourself in your bathroom by yourself into the mirror, I bet it's pretty funny. <laughs> Have you, have, you, have you played uh, the Secret Silly game with me before? I don't think so. Okay. This, okay, I've been doing this for about two years now, and I've played this with many, many, many of my female guests. And what this is is it's silly slumber party questions, and how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question, and I answer it. Okay. Steph, are you ticklish? Oh, I am baby ticklish. I I haven't been known to hit people in the groin. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> you that bad? Yeah. Where? Where's your tickle spot? Oh, just about everywhere, you know. Really? Yeah. And uh, there's a dominatrix that I've talked to on the podcast, right? And she, yes. she wouldn't mind, you know, putting me in shackles and tickling me. And I was like, I, I want to let you, I want to let you do that, you know, when I get some money, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> it would, it would feel good. You know, I like that kind of stuff. Oh man, I hate being tickled. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. You know why? I why? don't think so. Why? I think that it's because when I was in sixth grade, Mm-hmm. In science, we had to do a report on unusual things people don't know about people. Yeah. And I... Kind of like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I decided to figure out tickling. Where does tickling come from? Why do people tickle? Whoever gave anybody the idea to tickle another person in the first place? Mm-hmm. It was a form of torture. Mm-hmm. That's how tickling started out as a form of torture. Right. And since that's how it feels to me, <laughs> I think in my sixth grade mind, I blew it out of proportion, you know. Stop torturing me, being the dramatic gal that I am. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't stand it. I, the most I hate is when somebody, like, repeatedly tickles you in the same place over and over. You know, like that light, just bring your fingernails down the arm thing. Yeah. You do that once or twice, I'm good. You do that more than five times, I will stab you. <laughs> I will throw hands. It's not, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> it um, really makes me feel like my skin is pulling off my my meat. Yeah, the, the the key word is subjective. You know. Yeah. Uh, what is your yeah. favorite? What is your favorite part of the body? Oh. Uh, next. Next. That's good. 
I really like a good neck. And you're not gonna be you're not gonna be surprised by mine. What? The belly button. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Any kind? Do they have to be like Audis or Innies or? Oh, any kind. Um, any kind. Any kind. Last year on my birthday, a girlfriend of mine sent me a picture of hers so I can jerk off to it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe I couldn't believe she sent it to me too. I never thought she would. Oh, but see, that's that's a friendly gesture. Mm-hmm. It sure that's was. <laughs> you know something weird? What? When you have a child and they tie off their navel. Uh huh. They can actually create shapes inside a kid's navel hmm. when they sew it up. And inside my daughter's perfectly round belly button mm-hmm. is a five-pointed star. That's cute. It is cute. It's adorable. I've been trying to get her to get her belly button pierced because it's just so adorable. Nice, nice. I'm, the, I'm a bad mom. Everybody tells me, oh, you're such a good mom. I am a good mom. But I'm bad in the sense that I'm the one going, get your belly button. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good. It's so cute. It's going to hurt for a really long time and you won't be able to wear, like, anything on it for months. Mm. But it's going to be so cute. The black, the black girl in uh, in uh, Return of the Jedi who was playing a green girl, she was on the podcast a couple months ago. And... Um, I asked her if, her if her belly button was an Innie or an Audi, and she told me she had an Audi that she was born with, and it looked like a, a fucking baby's dick, and she sent me a picture of her as a baby, and I, my jaw fucking dropped. I was like, <laughs> that is a good thing that you had that removed. <laughs> she, oh said, she said it's nothing but a scar now. Nothing but a scar. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yes. She has no belly button. And how do you know that? I read it in People magazine. Okay. She had all those kids, and then she had a tummy tuck. Mm-hmm. And in order to do the tummy tuck, yeah, they had to do away with her belly button. So she said, who needs a belly button? Huh, I'm going to look that up because, wow, I, I'm always fascinated by people who don't have them. Um... It's so funny, though, to read that in people. That's not the, normally the kind of thing we read in people, I mean. Mm-hmm. But I was going back in their archives because I couldn't think of anything else to do. So I was on my computer going back in their archives and looking at Patricia Heaton because I really like her. Never met her, but I admire her. And I was kind of going down a list of people that I didn't know that much about. There she was. And I went, oh, no, that was funny. What? Yeah. That Patty, she's a sassy one. <laughs> Yeah. What color are your toenails painted? Right now, brown. A shiny, coppery brown. That's nice. I like that. And mine are not painted. They are uh, oh. all natu- au naturel, as they say. But ah. When I saw you last fall, they were purple with sparkles. They were. I remember that. Yes. You said it. you say is your best personality trait? Um, Oh, it's an awful personality trait. Uh, Oh, uh, honestly, my Mm -hmm. first reaction to people is to think the best of them. That is wonderful. I agree. Even if my my gut tells me something different, Mm -hmm. I will go ahead and be nice. Because I think, well, maybe it's because I'm feeling anxious. You know, or maybe it's, they're just having a bad day. But um, I'm just, I always try to, I just am. When I first meet people, I'm very nice, and I just think they're going to, I just trust that they're good people, and they're not going to do anything heinous or horrible, and there's nobody in the basement. Yes, 
I, I agree. Can you guess what mine are? Um, generosity. That's one of them, yes. But the the two that I that come off that really I that come off um off the, off the top of my head is my sense of empathy and the fact that I have no filter. I was just about to say the fact that you have incredible empathy. You do. Oh. You do. You do. You're incredibly empathetic. It's, uh, it's a beautiful and dangerous thing. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to... Beautiful for us, dangerous for you. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that you're unfiltered. Don't, you know, I, I just decided a few, honestly, a few days ago, we were like packing up to move and all this shit hit the fan and we couldn't and we were stuck here being squatters that we're not. And we <laughs> <laughs> were half our house is packed up and half of it is just a mess. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's funny to clean the house once a week around all the boxes. Mm-hmm. So, Here's, you know, I don't know. It's just one of those things where you think about. Yeah. Here's a here's yeah. a here's a question that's only for my very special non-filtered friends. How old were you the first time you got finger banged? Thirteen. Thirteen. I was twelve the first time I fingered a girl, and I was seventeen the first time I got a prostate milking. Ah. Yes. So that's about the time for everybody, isn't it? 12, 13, 14. And there? Yep. I, just about everybody I know has. Uh, there's a couple of people I've talked to who started late, like 18 or 19, but that's rare. Yeah. Hmm. And then my favorite question is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? <laughs> <laughs> what? What is it? Oh, it's so dumb. This is so, so dumb. What? I hate musk. Yeah. It's pretty bad. I can put up a blood, vomit, poop, dead people. Dead people? <laughs> It's either farts or feet, and this actress that I talked to, she said, that's the name of your memoir, Farts and Feet. Farts and Feet. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. I like that. You should do that. <laughs> I think I would put that, I think I would put that as a review blurb on the back. I don't think I would actually call it that. Here's a finger bang joke. How do you fuck your sister in a moral way? I don't know. How do you fuck your sister in a moral way? You finger bang her and look away. <laughs> she's so sexy, but she's my sister. I can't bear it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have a sister, by the way. <laughs> think of with incest as flowers in the attic. Oh, God, that's a terrifying movie. 
Oh, I had uh, I wanted to meet Christy Swanson at, at Monster Palooza a couple of years ago. She was such a twat, and I just had to walk away. Really, that's disappointing. Yeah, yeah, and she's a Trump supporter, hardcore on uh, Twitter. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That's shocking. Yeah, I was disappointed. Jeez. Hey, last night, this is interesting. This is this is a parenting thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have for years been writing down in a notebook called T-shirts that are going to be someday. All these things I want to put on T-shirts. Right. And um, my daughter always told me, she's 22 now, just about to be 22. Yeah. And she used to always tell me, that's so stupid, that's so stupid. You know, mm-hmm. so I just put telling her about it. And then I would make up band names, mm-hmm. you know, or movie names, or book titles, just for fun. And that was stupid. <laughs> and then, you know, I'm a horror fan, so I have to see every single horror movie that is, whether it's good or bad, whether I can understand it or not. And, you know, foreign language without the words written underneath can be confusing. But, it's, you know, I watched those. Yeah. So she's a oh, horror movie. I don't know why you like this thing. They're horrible. Well, guess who's making T-shirts watching horror movies? She's seen over 300 so far. 300, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and as her friends are doing a five-year episode of Let's Make Fans Make. Ugh. Every October, Steph, I do a month-long block of Strictly Horror People. And every year I try to outdo how many um, people... That I get for the month. Um, I didn't even come close last year to my 2018 number. This year, I'm going to really be persistent and, and try to go the distance. You know, um, I got like a huge list of, of, of horror people I want to reach out to and stuff. And hopefully, they won't be, you know, depressed as fuck about this quarantine. Because one of the great things about this quarantine is I've been able to get a lot of people who have nothing to do, you know? You know, it's been hard and awful in one way, but in another way, it's been really good. Mm-hmm. You get that. I don't have to explain that to you. Yeah. It's just been, I mean, like for Lance and Harper and I, mm-hmm. we spend this much time together in mm-hmm. the house, together, all the time. Mm-hmm. We've only had two arguments. Hmm. There's two. And one was really stupid. Most of them are. But the other one was about um, politics which got pretty serious. So mm-hmm. then we have found out we all actually believe the same thing, so it was a waste of time. But I think that's pretty miraculous. And I think that we understand each other, but this has really given me an opportunity to talk to both of them about what they believe and how they feel about things. And, you know, don't placate each other. Just say it. What do you think? Yeah. You know, so it's been fun. And watching horror movies with my kid, I've my whole life for that. Now she's That's 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 what's beautiful. That's beautiful. You've all come together, though. Do you think um, Harper? Weird. Oh, go ahead. It's weird. No, it's just weird. It's a lovely thing. We're better friends now. Oh, that's beautiful. Do you think uh, Harper would do my podcast? Yep, I think she would. It's funny. I've interviewed. Uh, I've interviewed two daughters of two actresses that are frequent guests that are friends of mine, right? One, I think I kind of made her a little uncomfortable, and the other one just absolutely loved me. Mm. Well, I have to talk to her about it first, and she has anxiety, so guess oh. who gave that to her? Does she does she drink alcohol at all? Very rarely. Well, maybe if she has a little cocktail, then she would be a little bit more relaxed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's so bizarre because it's at least it's. Not, I mean, my dad was had anxiety, and it's yeah. funny because I say oh, it's my fault, but it is genetic. Yeah, it is a it is a brain malfunction, misfiring, and it's weird because having a dad who had it, and now having a daughter who has it, and having it myself. Mm-hmm. It's like you know that you can't fix it. You just have to give big hugs and say it's okay. You're going to be okay. Huh. You are going to be okay. Yes, I agree. And it's, and I think what's interesting is that I think men have a harder time with anxiety because I think that they, a lot of them still think they have to fix it. Yeah. For other people, you know, like her dad would love 
have to fix this. Uh-huh. Who wants to fix it? I think so but too. You can't fix it. Yeah, I remember what Ron White said you can't fix stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's brilliant. You can't fix anxiety, that's for sure. Oh my God. You... Say, well, just buck up. You know, my mom used to say things. She'd be like, well, buck up. I'm like, well, that helps. Thanks. Don't be stupid. Okay. <laughs> I hadn't thought about being stupid, but now that you've mentioned it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Well, Steph, I thank you so much for coming on as usual because we always have a great time no matter what. Thank you. I have one question for you. What is your favorite color? My favorite color is blue. Blue. Okay. Hey, thank you. This has been really fun. It's been really nice to talk to somebody besides my husband and my kid. Yeah. <laughs> well, what is your favorite color? My blue. Blue. Yeah. Blue. I... I like my, my, my colors just like my humor. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I asked my husband what his favorite color was when we first met, and he said clear. Clear. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, well, I found him attractive immediately. Yeah. <laughs> well, you take good care, okay? Please, yes. Please. And I'm sending you something in the mail. Oh, thank, thank you. And don't and don't let this whole, you know, thing get to you, you know, because everything will turn around and we'll get back to normal and you'll be acting again and kicking ass. And l- let me know, yeah, about um, uh, Perry Mason uh, premiering, you know, if I don't hear from it first. Okay. Thank you so much, honey. I love you. Okay. I love you, too. All right. You'll be good. Well, okay. be well. Okay. Be Bye-bye. <laughs> Well, there you have it. Stephanie Hodge. Oh, ain't she just... She's a gem. She's beyond the sweetheart. She is a gem. She is the real deal. I love her. She's like my aunt. My Aunt Steffi. Oh, I love Steph. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook.